Hello everyone. I'm really excited to be here because the first international conference talk that I ever gave was actually right here on the stage. Um, I came in 2016 for, I think it was the very first CSS Conf Budapest, and what I talked about was actually styling using just CSS and HTML. But now today we're going to bring CSS, HTML, and a little bit of JavaScript together and see how we could craft stateful styles with state machines, which Mike talked about at the very beginning. So basically the hello world of any design system, any component library is, of course, your button. So imagine we have this button, you get this design, you're happy, it looks good, but there's many different variants, like Mike talked about, that this button can be in. So we have to consider what happens if you hover the button, what happens if the button is active, and what happens if the button is disabled. So you might be thinking we're done here, but we have to also think about the application states that this button can be in too. For example, if we're fetching data, we might want to fade it out. If it's a success, we might want to have it be green and say, hey, we got your data. Or if it's an error, you might want it to be a different variant, such as red. But looking at application behavior and component styles this way is very limited, because we also have to think about how we transition between these states. To illustrate this problem, let's say we have this fetch button. User clicks it, we're waiting for data, and we eventually get it. That's great. But what happens if the data takes a long time to load? Then maybe we want to show a spinner, and eventually we get our data. But if you're like me, then you'll get frustrated after a while and start clicking this button a few times, and this is going to make a lot of unnecessary API requests until you finally get your data. But you're a developer and you're smart. You think, you know what? I'm going to disable the button. And that way they could only click it once, they have to wait for the data, and then it comes back successfully. But guess what? I'm a developer too. I know Chrome DevTools, so I could just go in, undisable that button, and make as many requests as I want. <laughs> so I ran into this problem a lot of times. And I wasn't always good at JavaScript, which is why, at the very beginning, I decided to see how much I could do with just HTML and CSS. This was one of the very first code pens that I made using hover states to just go between the days and recreate this drivel by uh, Tubic Studio, as well as this one. Now, to do uh, to do complex animations like this, you sort of have to use a few hacks uh, if you're not going to use JavaScript. And so that's exactly what I did. Just like was talked about in the very first talk, I used checkboxes because checkboxes can represent states and radio buttons as well. So what I did here was, if you have a checkbox and it sort of lives outside the app, you could use the squiggly selector, the tilde selector, which is more formally known as the adjacent sibling selector, but I mean, no one's going to remember that. And you could apply a label inside the app that labels are great because they magically map the, um, the checkbox over to the label in your app. So when you click the label, it doesn't matter where it is, it will check that checkbox. And so what happens is when you click that label, which could be a button or anything else, then that checkbox is going to be checked. You could use the squiggly selector and select that box and make it change styles. And you could also do this with more than one checkbox, which gives you sort of that dynamic behavior and dynamic styling. Now, like I mentioned, you could do this with both checkboxes and radios with one distinction. With checkboxes, you could have zero or more checkboxes checked. But what I found myself using more and more were radio buttons because it enforced the idea that you could have only one of them checked at a time. So I was playing around with this, and I was playing around with crazier things like this CSS-only dog animation that I showed at the very first CSS Comp Budapest that I was at. And um, I decided to go with my friend Shaw, and we do this weekly live stream called the Keyframers, in which we bring imaginative user interfaces to life using HTML, CSS, and a little bit of JavaScript. So what we do is we take these really complex animations from Dribbble and we try to recreate them live on the air in under two hours. But what we found ourselves seeing more and more is that a lot of these animations are states-based. And not just two states, so we can't use a checkbox, 
but three states where you click and you know you might go back or you might have this plate button and then you go to something else. So that's uh, more easily illustrated here because we have this playlist state at the top which shows what state our app is in and you could scroll through these albums and this is another recreation of a dribble and so you could drag back and forth and you could see that the state of our entire application changes as the user interacts with this application. And so you could see those moving side to side. So this sort of illustrates the problem that we have with our current design systems and the current way that we develop is that a designer might present you a very high fidelity mockup or um, you know, just like a simple prototype, but that mockup represents only one of potentially many, if not hundreds, thousands of possible states that your app or your components can be in. And so the, pro I'm sorry, the problem is that this iteration cycle is a bit slow because not only does a designer have to make all of those changes in all of those different screens, but if the logic changes, if a design changes, you have to go through all of those possible changes or all of those possible screens and apply those changes. So what, um, what we do currently today, and I'm sure most of you are guilty of this, I know I was guilty of this for the longest time, is we apply classes. We're like, okay, if this button is in a loading state, then we have a class of loading, of course. So we could do the same with success. But the problem with class is we can't enforce that we only have one possible value, so we might have a button that shows loading and success. And some of you might think, like, I'm, I'm smart enough not to do this. I have class list. I could remove the loading class and then add the success class. But as many of you know, this does happen in the real world. And this is something that we want to avoid. So is there a better way that we could model the state for our dynamic UIs and have it in a way that we could visualize it and easily uh, see all these possible states and be able to know how states change from one state to another in our app? And can we do it in a more formal way that designers and developers can understand equally? So I looked at a lot of different prototyping apps like origami.design, Envision app, which you define each of the different states and it smoothly transitions between each of them. Uh, Prototype does the same thing where it's sort of like magic move for designers because you could define shapes and it will magically transform them, scale them, translate them into the shape that they're supposed to be and you could add triggers. And then there's more formal user flow tools such as overflow.io in which you could design each of these screens and add these custom triggers. So what I realized was common between all of these tools and more is that user flows are these transitions between these user interface states and these transitions could be caused based on either user events or other external events such as a timer, an API request coming in, etc. And so this brings me to the topic of finite state machines and state charts, which, I mean, if you know me long enough, you know that this is what I talk about. You could type state machine on Twitter and I will find you and I will respond to you. It's just my thing. One of my favorite definitions of a state is actually in the ARIA guidelines in the w3.org website, where a state is a dynamic property that expresses the characteristics of an object in a certain point of time. So this point of time can be in response to a user action or other automated processes or external events that come in. And so this is a distinction between properties such as like a, an anchor might have an href tag or an href attribute or a button can have a variant where you know that that's not going to change. But state is different. State describes at one point in time, this represents my component and that could change at any time. And Area also has all of these built-in attributes for states that they, they describe as stateful attributes, which uh, describe um, you know, certain finite states of components such as invalid, valid, disabled, current, and um, yeah. So finite state machines are pretty much the same concept where 
it has five parts. I'm going to review finite state machines real briefly. There's a ton of resources on this, though. But a finite state machine is one that has an initial state. It has a finite number of states, which means we could only be in one of those states at a time. It has a finite number of events, and these are the signals that cause transitions between those states. It has a mapping of transitions that go between those states. So for example, for an idle and the user makes a fetch request by pressing a button, now we're in the pending state. And it also has a finite number of final states, which represent the app being done, there being no more left to do. So the beauty of these finite state machines is, number one, they could be visualized, such as this state diagram. And number two, they outline just all the possible transitions and what's not possible as well. So if we do a search action on the searching state, we realize that there is no transition outgoing from the searching state, so that search should have no effect. And this is exactly what we want to occur so that the user doesn't keep making all of these different API requests. So to do this in CSS and HTML and to do it in a scalable way, I employed the use of data attributes. So whereas we can't use ARIA attributes for everything, we could use data attributes to describe a more colorful, and more varied way of describing all of the possible states of our application or of the individual components as well. The added attributes are something that are very underused, but this goes back to the beginning of HTML, and I highly encourage you to use it because they end up being a lot simpler than class names uh, to use. So for example, we could have a data state equals loading, and we could target that using an attribute selector in CSS, data state equals loading. And so in JavaScript, it actually makes it really easy to, um, to change the, the data attribute of whatever you're working with. So we could have a data state, and we could say you know it's loading or success. And then we could change that, or we could delete it completely, and then it's gone. And so changing it is just setting that attribute, and deleting it is just deleting. So there's no weird APIs like classList.add, classList.has, classList.remove that you have to worry about. It's just JavaScript. So these data attributes represent each one of these finite states in your components or your application. For example, this button, we could have data state of idle, which means nothing happened yet. We could have loading. We could have a success and we could have a failure. So you could also imagine that you, you, you can name these states whatever you want, and that's the beauty of these data attributes. So how do we implement data attributes with these finite states? Traditionally, finite state machines, especially in other languages, can be done using switch case statements, where you would first figure out what state you're in, and you would switch on that. So for example, if we're in the searching state, we go to the case statement for searching, and then we switch on what events occurred. So if you're used to Redux, I know I'm getting into JavaScript a little bit here, but Redux or NGRX or uh, any of those reducers, then typically you would do action first. But now we're doing it the other way around. We're looking at what state we're on first, and then we're going to the event. Uh, I call it events instead of action because that's a more accurate term. But we check what events just happened, and what state we should go to next based on that event, such as success. And of course, if that is not handled by the switch case statement, then you just default to the same state. Now, personally, I find switch case statements a little bit verbose, so I like to do object mapping instead. And so this is just, you, it looks like a big JSON object, and it's essentially the same idea, where you have a state, such as searching, you look at the on property to see which events just occurred, and if there's a mapping between the events and the next state that should happen, and if there isn't, you just default to the current state. So I also wrote a library for this called xState, which you do not have to use. It doesn't apply directly to what I'm talking about, because you could do this today without any JavaScript library, but I just felt like mentioning it because it does have a lot of these things built in. To use xState, you would just have a machine uh, function which takes in that object configuration, and it gives you a few nice things such as automatic um, transitions, so you don't need to code that transition function yourself. 
And you could say, if I'm in the idle state and the search event happens, then we should go to the searching state. That's actually wrong. I'll correct that. But um, yeah, so here's an example over here. Have you ever wondered how, how to implement sort of a, a drag and drop type of thing? I mean, it, it, it looks pretty simple, but then you get around to trying to implement it and saying, okay, which event listeners do I need to listen to? What do I have to do? When do I stop listening to these event listeners? Um, and, and it just gets really confusing, so you probably reach for a library. But it's actually a lot simpler than it seems. If you think about drag and drop as two states, either idle or dragging, and you think about four properties, the x and y, which represents the position of the object, and the dx, dy, which represents how far you move the object, then it becomes pretty easy to visualize this as two states, idle, and then when you pick something up like this, that's like your dragging state. So I'm, I'm changing the dx, dy properties, and then I would move it somewhere, and then once I stop, now I'm in the idle state again. And so we could visualize this here. Once I start dragging, you see those dx, dy properties moving, and then I drop it, and then now I change those to x and y, and then I could do it again. And so you can see it's very easy to visualize these two uh, states within the context of your application and your animations. And this I'm displaying, by the way, using those um, data attributes as well. So we could also, um, if you want to do more advanced animations based on uh, what state you're on and what state you came from, because um, the different actions that could happen depend on which state that you may have come from. Um, and so that's why using a data prev state attribute, stands for previous state, can be useful as well. Because you know we could have two different things. For example, uh, if we're coming to a loading state from an idle state, that might do one thing. But if we're coming from an error state, then maybe we want to show an error gone animation, and then we're back to loading. And then so in our same function where we apply those data attributes, we would just set the previous state to whatever the state was before. And we could target those right in our CSS just by combining those selectors like so. And so this, if it ever loads, is an example of that. So we, we have different behaviors based on whether we're going up, for example. And then we have a different animation over here. And then going down, it does something different. So we do want to keep track of which state that we came from. And so again, this is using data attributes to change which state we're in. So. so as I started playing around more with this idea of using finite state machines for animations, I saw more and more complex animations on Dribbble that I really wanted to recreate, such as this one by Gal Shear, which lets you extend your weekend, which I really hope I, was, I want to do this weekend. So I, I broke this animation down, and I started to see all of the different states of it. So at the beginning, when the user starts dragging their mouse, then we start searching, or sorry, we start selecting each of the days. And then once the user lets go, now we're in the selected state. So now a mouse movement is going to mean something different because then we're in the dragging state and we could move those states around. And then we're in the disposed state, so once we start grabbing, now the mouse movement means something different. It means we're extending a day. So the exact same event can mean something different depending on what state you're on. And I think that that's a really important point. So uh, just to show you over here, if I start dragging and selecting, remember, mouse movement means one thing. So I could start dragging over here. And if I don't go to the trash can, then it just goes back there and back to that state. And so I could drag it all the way here, disposes, and then now I'm in the grabbing state, which means that if I move my mouse and I start dragging outside, it's not going to have that initial behavior of showing the selection rectangle because I'm not in that state where that behavior is defined. So that's an important point when dealing with application state is not just mapping an event to an action or to side effects, but instead mapping it to what state you're in, 
and what events just happened, mapping those two together. So using the state machine, which I created using xState, but of course you don't need to, uh, you could also automatically generate visualizations such as this, which explain the whole process of the logic of um, you know, how the app is supposed to behave once you're dragging and dropping certain things. So does this scale? That's a big problem, which, um, which we have to talk about because, of course, once you have so many different combinations, like Mike was talking about, then we could have an exponentially large number of states, and we sort of need to manage that. Thankfully, a solution in 1987 by a computer scientist by the name of David Harrell uh, sort of solved that for us. It says 1997 there, but it was actually a decade earlier. So these are really, really old ideas. State charts extend the idea of state machines by adding things such as actions, whether you're entering a state, exiting a state, or performing a transition between states. It has guards, so you can make sure that transitions only occur when a condition based on the state is met. There's also the idea of hierarchy, so you could have nested states. You could think of those as sub-routes, or if you're in one state, and you could be in a sub-state of that state. Also orthogonality, which represents two different ideas of states which don't really have too much to do, to do to each, with each other, but you want to represent them both equally. And the idea of history states as well. So hierarchical states can really help simplify how we combine states and make the logic easier. So we see in the success and failure state, the search events can occur from both of them. So instead, we could group those two together and make it so that whether we're in the success or failure state, that search event can take us back to the searching state. So in X state, that's done just by nesting those states within the search state over there. And then we could see that when we perform the search event on any of those states, then we go back to the searching state. So it really simplifies the design of, these, um, of, of the logic. Now, to represent these nested states and hierarchical states in CSS, we have to get a little bit into the weeds of data attribute selectors. So of course, we have the existence selector, which just checks if it exists. We have the data attribute selector of if it's exactly equal to, if it contains anywhere at all, if it starts with something such as idle, if it contains, or if it ends with something such as error, or this is the one we want. If our data state or our data attribute contains the string uh, passed in, such as idle.error, but that string is basically a word, it's separated by white space. And this makes it X just like a class. Now, this isn't the same as saying that we're in two states at the same time. We're really in this idle.error state, but we want that idle just to let CSS know that we are in that parent state. And so we could use data attributes as like even further, like data show and data hide, and um, use that to show which elements are active based on which state we're on. And so that's just with a little bit of JavaScript. You don't need to read this code right now, but just know that by, um, by just figuring out what state we're in, we could show elements based on what state we're on. And so you could play around with that idea. You don't have to use data show or data hide. You could just use whatever you want to use. But the idea is that you're not directly toggling classes or toggling attributes on each of these states. So for the final example, here's this uh, password form. And you could see that there's this idle and idle.normal substate that we're in. Because if I enter a password incorrectly, and it validates, now we go to idle.error. And eventually, it goes back to idle.normal. Because we want those two states to be similar, but also we want them to be distinct enough so that we could group its similar characteristics and its unique characteristics, such as showing the red outline when, when the password is incorrect. Then we eventually have a success state as well. So the main idea that I want to bring home to you is that you should think in states and events and not just events. And the reason for doing this is because once you define your application and your components as a finite state machine or a state chart and you model it in a very explicit way, you could do some really cool things such as visualize these. And so just to show you, that animation I just showed you can be visualized right over here. So 
I copied and pasted the machine used to define, and we could see that we're in the idle state, but we're also in the normal state as well. And so when we change, now we go to the validating state, and if it's an error, then it's invalid, and then we go back to the normal state, just like that. Now, so there's a lot of powerful um, applications of this, such as analysis, automatic testing, and other things that I talk about. Um, but there's also other tools that could do this for you. Sketch.Systems is a very useful tool for prototyping your applications and your designs using these I same ideas of finite state machines and state charts, because you could write it in the pseudo syntax and be able to play around with it in a little prototype editor at the bottom. So I highly encourage you to check that out. There's a lot of advantages to using state charts. NASA used them th uh, themselves with the Mars rover, which, I mean, honestly, if you have one shot at going to production with a multi-hundred billion dollar thing, you don't want to fuck it up. So, I mean, <laughs> imagine doing this in JavaScript. It would, it would go nowhere. So. There's a lot of advantages to this. Um, they had visualized modeling, precise diagrams. They were able to use those state charts to generate code automatically and also to make sure that every single possible thing that could happen to this Mars rover was tested and was covered. And also when requirements changed, they didn't have to go into code to figure out what needs to change, but instead they could just go to the diagram and see, okay, this is now this, so now we have to have an arrow to here, and this goes here. And so it's a lot easier to, to deal with these automatic late-breaking changes with visual diagrams instead of code. Now, of course, there are disadvantages because, as you could tell, there is a huge learning curve, and modeling these state charts requires planning ahead. You can't just put your head down in code. You need to actually stop and plan it and draw those boxes and draw those arrows and give it to your developers and designers and say, is this a correct behavior in our application? And of course, you can't just use finite state machines for everything, but they could be a very good abstraction for the overall logic of your applications. There are also complexity trade-offs where you might say, I don't need state charts because my application is so simple. And that's when you might use finite state machines, whereas normal code, uh, which I call bottom-up code because we're putting everything in the event listeners instead of, um, instead of structuring it in a nice modeled way, it increases linearly, but as we saw, finite state machines can I increase exponentially. State charts, however, might seem more complex at first, but they manage complexity at scale. And this is why I love using them, because no trivial app ever stays trivial. Once more features come in, it becomes so much more complex, and you want a good way to manage that complexity. There's a lot of resources online for learning about state machines and state charts, which I encourage you to check out. There's a community on spectrum.chat slash state charts, and there's the world of state charts, which just explains in a very easy to read way how to get started with state charts and what kinds of problems they solve. So in general, I want to make your code do more than just applying the application logic. I want you to be able to visualize, automatically test, analyze, simulate your applications and your components, and be able to visualize all the possible states and transitions between your components and applications. Thank you very much, CSS Comp Budapest. That was great. <laughs>